Right to be read podcast, episode number 114, interview with Dory Clark. You are listening to the Right to be Read podcast, and this is your host, Ani Alexander. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Right to be Read podcast, the podcast that inspires and encourages writers. I'm your host, Annie Alexander, and today I have a very special interview. Today, during this interview, we will be covering different exercises and processes that will help you with many things that you need to do as an author and as someone who is branding yourself. So today, uh, Dory Clark, who is my guest, will help us with um, reinventing ourselves and with building a platform and with actually branding ourselves. So basically, we will be covering a three-step process of reinventing yourself. And we will also um, go through a three-word exercise. And I won't be telling too much, so you will hear all the details from Dory Clark in the interview. So for those of you who don't know who Dory Clark is, she is a marketing strategy consultant, professional speaker, and frequent contributor to the Harvard Business Review, Time, Entrepreneur, and the World Economic Forum blog. Recognized as a branding expert by the Associated Press, Fortune, and Inc. magazine, she is the author of Reinventing You, Define Your Brand, Imagine Your Future, and her recent book, Stand Out, how to find your breakthrough idea and build a following around it. So let's jump to the interview and see what we can learn from Dory. Hello, Dory. I'm really happy to have you over. It's a great honor to have you on my show and welcome to The Right to be Read. Hey, Ani. Thank you so much. Glad to be talking with you. Well, it's really interesting uh, because uh, we kind of, you know, we were introduced by Suzanne Rohan, whom I interviewed too. But apparently, since we had many, many common friends on Facebook, I have seen your profile picture and I have seen some of your updates periodically before that even. So it's, it's interesting how social media works and how we end up meeting people we never met, but sort of having this feeling that we know them somehow, at least partly. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's true. It is a small world. Okay, so um, let's start from the very beginning. I know that you are, uh, you know, doing many, many different things. You're a marketing strategy consultant, you're a professional speaker, uh, you write for big websites. And uh, but besides all that, you are also an author. So I would like to dive into the this part of your activities and understand how how and why did you decide to write your very first book? Yeah, so I I had really always wanted to write a book. It was something that I was uh, interested in since I was a kid. I, I just thought I admired authors a lot and thought it would be really cool. And so uh, just aspired to do it at some point. And so in 2009, that was when I really got serious about it. I decided I needed to, to really make an effort to make it happen. And so, of course, I ended up pursuing the goal in exactly the wrong way because I didn't know how to do it. And so uh, for, for me, I, I thought that what would happen or what would be the best thing is that I would just um, write a bunch of book proposals and and I thought, oh, well, you know, one of these topics that I write a book proposal about is clearly going to resonate and they're going to think it's amazing. And so the publisher is going to accept it. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote three book proposals in the first half of 2009 and all of them got rejected because basically I heard back that I wasn't famous enough. And I had always been under what I now realize was a misimpression that I could I could just write a book and that that would get you know get me well known because of writing the book. Uh, but especially and you know a, a number of years ago that probably was the case. But especially after um, 2008, where the the publishing industry went through a really 
uh, severe recession and contraction, and they, they had tons of layoffs and everything, the industry got very conservative, and they really changed in a big way. They were not taking risks on first-time authors uh, in the way that they had before. The advances that they started to pay uh, began diminishing rapidly, and they became really hesitant to, uh, to do contracts with anybody who did not already have a built-in following. And so I realized that I was going to have to start from square one if I was going to be successful. And so I had to uh, – it was frustrating because it meant I had to take a couple extra years uh, on my plan. <laughs> but uh, I had to go back and start building that platform. And in my case, I did it through blogging and was able to um, to slowly begin to build up enough credibility based on uh, the publications that I was writing for and enough name recognition that uh, a publisher ultimately was interested in working with me and uh, and giving me a contract, which I finally received in 2011. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it took you two years to build the platform, which was sufficient enough to to have this uh, credibility and social proof to get the contract from the traditional publisher, I guess. Exactly, yes. So uh, it, that makes me kind of, you know, uh, wonder. I, I had many guests over at the podcast who were arguing that, you know, um, yes, that's what the traditional publishers want. But once you get to that stage when you already have your platform and you have already, you know, sufficiently big audience in place, why would you eventually need a publisher later on? In that case, you could probably self-published and get successful um, by yourself. Yeah, I mean, that's right. You totally don't, <laughs> <laughs> to tell the truth. Uh, I mean, there. I would, I would say, you know, my analysis for whatever it's worth of the uh, of the publishing industry is that there there still is I mean it has been rapidly diminishing over the past five years but there still is a sort of reputational advantage to publishing with a, a mainstream publisher um, it's very hard to uh, you know it's not impossible but it's very hard to get your book stocked in a in an actual bookstore mm -hmm. for instance if you are self-published very hard to get your book reviewed in uh, in a newspaper or other publications if your book is self-published and so I, I you know the distribution is uh, is infinitely easier if you have a publisher uh, handling it that that has expertise in it um, but but all that being said uh, those differences have diminished a lot over the past five years, and I'm willing to bet that in the next five years, they will probably diminish down to zero. Um, so I, I think that uh, for people who do have a platform and can reach their own audiences directly, obviously the, there's huge financial benefits to self-publishing. Um, you know, I get the equivalent of, you know, like a dollar or two dollars a book uh, whenever a book is sold. I mean, that's... Um, you know, a pittance. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas if you are self-publishing, you, you know, you'll be getting 70% or whatever if it's, uh, you know, let's say if you're selling a book on, on Amazon. And uh, that's that's enormous. And so if you already have the base, you do need to, to look very carefully at your options because you need the publisher a lot less. Uh huh. Yeah, I see. So, how did it feel actually? You know, the contract was signed. I assume since it it was uh, a traditional publisher, it took you yet uh, a bit longer until the book was actually ready and in the market, right? It did. Uh, it took just under two years for my first book to be published. I oh, signed <laughs> the yeah. I signed the contract in May of 2011, and the book came out in April of 2013. Um, so I was actually surprised that it took that long, uh, but it's not uncommon, I guess. Um, my second book, my most recent book, Stand Out. Uh, I signed the contract for that in uh, early November of. 2013 and the book came out in April of uh, 2015 so just a couple of months ago and uh, so that was about a year and a half long process um, mm -hmm. so anyway it's it's somewhere in that ballpark so it'll it'll definitely take a while um, it's crazy to me that in the internet era uh, that's what the process still looks like I mean I think that oh, yeah. has to change uh, it's it's 
going to change. There's no question about it. But um, but it is what it is for now. And you know, there's some advantages. I mean, you can you know you do get careful editing. You have time to to work on it. Um, your manuscript is done for about, at least six months before it mm-hmm. comes out. So you, uh, if you're diligent, if you're responsible and know what you should be doing, uh, you can spend that time planning out the marketing of it. Uh, so that's positive, but, um, but yeah, there is a really long lag time. Mm-hmm, I see. So, so what, how did it feel? I mean, you if obviously spent so much time waiting until you eventually got the contract with the publisher. Then you had yet another period when you waited until the book was actually, you know, ready and out. So how did it feel to finally have that book in your hands? Well, it, it's, it certainly felt really good. Um, I'll also say, too, that to a certain extent, I mean, this is kind of a, a funny thing. It may it may be my own hang up, but uh, once I once I got the contract signed for that for that two year process in between uh, signing the contract and the book coming out, I actually felt a lot of existential peace. And the reason for that is that um, you know, really, the book contract for me represented a kind of. Uh, external validation really Mm -hmm. uh Mm -hmm. it was uh you know the book wasn't out but but it was it was a statement to the world that my work was good enough for a book to come out and you know they only they only had to wait and it would and it would happen uh but it it really did feel like uh you know get getting some kind of a nod of approval where um you know i was able to say you know i mean it's it's a great thing to be able to say you're a published author but it's it's you know it's almost as good a thing to be able to say oh i have i have a contract you know the book is going to be coming out um and uh that that really helped in terms of, uh, I think my credibility in terms of my consulting practice. And it certainly helped my self-confidence because I, I felt like I had achieved something that a lot of people want, but, but, uh, you know, don't necessarily have access to. Uh, so that, that was a, a really nice feeling, even just signing the contract for it. Mm-hmm, I see. So you mentioned that um, uh, when you went back and had to create your platform and audience, you basically did this through blogging. And these days, it's kind of, you know, quite, you know, much harder to, to build audience through blogging than a few years ago. So what are the challenges? And do you think it's still possible to, to get uh, audience through blogging solely? Yeah, I do actually. I mean, you know, I'm talking about, you know, I I was uh getting serious about it really, you know, in you know, I was sort of trying a little bit in 2009, but 2010 was really the first year that I that I was very serious about blogging. And, you know, I would say that that uh, yes, I mean, things were perhaps less crowded then, but not markedly so. I mean, it's not like somebody starting to blog in, you know, in, um, you know, 2000, for instance, and then they have this competitive advantage because, you know, now they've been blogging for 15 years or something like that. I mean, that was that was when it was really a legitimately uncrowded marketplace. By 2010, it was actually still pretty crowded. Um, so I, um, you know, there, there's the, the Chinese proverb that, uh, the best time to have planted a tree mm-hmm. was 20 years ago, but the yeah. the next best time is today. And so I think it's uh, I think it's similar to to that. Um, you know, whatever. Really, what I would say is there's two factors that people should be thinking about when it comes to platform building. Uh, one is where does your audience congregate? You know, who who are the people you want to reach, and what are the ways that they like to consume information? Mm-hmm. Uh, so. You know, it could it could be podcasts, it could be videos, it could be Pinterest, it could be Twitter, it could be blogging, you know, whatever whatever it is. Um, but thinking about your audience first is really crucial. And then the second place is where it overlaps with your own skills and interests and predilections. So there are going to be some people that just to hate video. They just hate looking at themselves on TV. And if that's the case, you know, even if, uh, you know, your audience is consuming a lot of video – you just aren't going to want to do that because it's going to be really painful for you. And so, you know, maybe something else is better. Maybe audio is better or maybe writing is better. And so it's, it's just finding that, that overlap of, um, of your audience and what feels right to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. So your first book was called reinventing you define your brand, imagine your future. Um, 
is it about personal branding or it's something else also? Yeah, it, it, it is about personal branding and professional reinvention. Um, up to that time, I had, you know, the work that I had done had really not been with individuals. It was, uh, it was corporate and government and nonprofit uh, marketing and branding. And so essentially what I did was I wrote a book applying those principles to individuals because I, I felt very confident that they were transferable. And, uh, and that, was, that was the genesis of it. I mean, actually subsequent to writing Reinventing You, I've been approached by uh, many entrepreneurs and high-level executives who are interested in coaching and things like that around the issues. And so I've started working with individuals a bit. Um, but up to that point, I, I really hadn't. It was, uh, it was corporate stuff applied to individuals to help them through some period of change. And you know, the, the, folks, the folks who are generally the readers of Reinventing You are folks who they are looking to make a change in their lives, which could be that they want to change jobs, change careers, or even just that they want to change how other people view them. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really about getting their true talents recognized. And so I created a book to try to make that process easier for people, um, to help them get through that transformation process in a faster and better way. Okay, I see. So basically, if we look at... Um most of the people who are listening to us now, uh, we are having, you know, potential um, readers of your book because we have a full-time workers who work in different spheres, but who want to transform themselves and to become uh, authors eventually. Yes, exactly. So basically your book will help them um, in that transition in, in which respect exactly? Well, so... In Reinventing You, I describe a three-step process for uh, for reinventing yourself. The first step is getting clear about where you are now. You know, what what is your current brand? Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of people think they know, but we all as, as individuals have blind spots. And so I talk about the process of how to really get a clear sense of where you're excelling, what you're known for, what your sort of distinct competitive advantages are. Um, the next step is about creating a really fleshed out vision of where you want to go. Um, you know, what does that look like? And if there's a gap between where you are now and where you want to be, which is the case for most people, what do you need to do? How do you create this action plan that can get you from point A to point B? Uh, so I walk through that process. And that includes things like uh, taking control of your narrative and how, you, how do you tell the story of your reinvention to other people so that it makes sense to them and so that you can get them on board and be supportive of it. And then the final piece is what I call living your brand, which is where you want to make sure that Everything that you do is acting consistently and in accordance with a new brand you want to be showing to the world. And, you know, some people think that, oh, you know, your personal brand, that's like your, your elevator pitch. But it is about so much more than just what you say about yourself. It's about literally everything you do. Because it's the sum total of the impressions that other people have about you. So it's everything from what are your Google search results to uh, who do you hang out with to what professional associations you're involved in to what content you're creating, etc. And so I walk people through that process of how to really um, – in an authentic and consistent way, live out their brand. Uh, so that's the process that I describe in Reinventing You. And then with Stand Out, I help, I help them take it a step even further. That's kind of like the 201 version of once you've found the place where you want to excel, how do you then go about becoming recognized as being among the best in your field? Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. So basically, if someone is writing books and, you know, a starting from scratch in terms of audience building and, and getting recognizable, um, he should basically decide in advance what kind of personal brand he wants to create before going out and blogging and, you know, becoming visible and doing all the things that needs to be done, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'll also mention, you don't necessarily have to have everything figured out from the start. I mean, that's, that's probably a high hurdle and possibly, uh, an impossible goal. So, um, so 
I think that it's just important for people to be aware of where they are in the process and uh, be upfront about that. So, for instance, one of the examples that I cite in Stand Out that I think is uh, is useful and emblematic is there's a guy named Josh Kaufman, and he wrote a book called The Personal MBA. And what I think is uh, is pretty interesting is – you know, this is something that, that started with him blogging and then he later turned it into a book. But he basically decided, hey, I, I don't want to get an MBA. Like, I don't want to take the time or spend the money to do it, but I really want to learn this stuff. So I am going to get my own MBA, quote unquote, by reading all of the classic business books. And mm-hmm. so he started blogging about that process. And so when he started, you know, he was not an expert. He absolutely was not coming from an expert place about, oh, let me tell you about, you know, all the great classics of business literature. He was a student. And he was blogging about his journey. Um, But it's okay to do that. And people decided that they liked him, they liked the idea, and they wanted to come along for the ride. And so I think that that that's something that that we can do. If we we just share honestly where we are, um, that can attract a lot of interest in a lot of followers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see. And and I think that uh, in, in that case, uh, you know, being authentic and kind of, you know, pre- presenting you from from the real place that where you are actually kind of, you know, audience will relate to it much more than, you know, because I, I had listeners who were writing to me that when I was um, interviewing very successful men, uh, f- female newbie writers weren't relating to and they thought that you know oh this is not for me it doesn't mean that I can do it too he's a successful guy he's a man he's etc etc so basically I was having the discouraging effect by bringing in too many big names which were like too far away from my listeners yeah that's really <laughs> interesting yeah, I was amazed by uh, by the emails I was receiving. But apparently, you know, by trying to encourage and show how far they have gone, I had, you know, for some, I, I've got the opposite effect. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's, um, let's see uh, when one's is trying to kind of present himself online and, you know, be himself and, and try to show people part of the personality and part of what he's writing about and and you know get this holistic picture of 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 the how he's he wants to be perceived by others what are the components that he has to take into account and kind of you know build that piece by piece yeah so when it when it comes to uh to you know this first step of really uh understanding how you're perceived by others and you know beginning to think through how you'd like to be uh, one of the exercises that I actually suggest in reinventing you is uh, what I call the the three word exercise and it's it's pretty fast and it's pretty easy uh, but over the course of a week, I suggest that people go to about a half a dozen uh, friends and colleagues and ask them this question, which is if you you only had three words to be able to describe me, what would they be? And the reason that that is useful, I mean, A, it's an easy question, so someone can can answer it, you know, just in a minute or two. But what's powerful about it is that it really forces people to – uh, to narrow it down dramatically to, you know, what are the top things? Because they could they could go on for 10 minutes about all the different oh, nuances yeah. <laughs> about you. But what you really want to know is, no, no, no. What stands out the most? And by the time you actually talk to four or five people, you are going to see unmistakable patterns um, that are really interesting. I mean, I actually did this with a uh, with a group of entrepreneurs and uh, I was speaking to them and they decided to do an exercise in real time. <laughs> and uh, so they had a guy in their group. They all knew each other pretty well. And they sent him out of the room and everybody wrote down their three words about him. And then he came back in the room and they read them to him. And It turned out that out of about 10 people in the room, seven of them, the very first word that they used was creative. And that is, you know, that that's real evidence that's that's powerful. I mean, I'm sure he probably thought of himself as a reasonably creative guy, but to hear that that is the thing that stands out so dramatically uh, for other people about you is really useful information that you just wouldn't otherwise have a way of knowing unless you asked. And it's something that you can... Uh, that you can build on. Uh-huh. 
Okay, so that's what I'm going to do today. After this interview, I'm hopping on Facebook and I'm going to randomly choose 10 friends and ask this question. <laughs> Perfect. Good job, Ani. I like it. <laughs> okay, so basically when you see the trend and you see the obvious thing that is in common and many people mention, you can go ahead and capitalize on that basically and build around it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that, uh, you know, that's that's the, the thing that, that too few of us do. Um, if you have a strength like that, then you, you want to go for it. Um, so, you know, for instance, you know, with this guy uh, being known as, as being really creative, if that's the, the brand that, that he's known for, um, then, you know, it might suggest certain things to him. It might suggest that that's the area that uh, the people want to hear from him about, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe he could start, you know, writing or blogging or speaking or doing podcasts or whatever about how, how regular people can be more creative in their own professional lives or things like that. And you know that he's already got a base of people who would be interested and who would respect what he has to say because to him, uh, because to them, that's what he is known for. Okay. Yeah, I see. I see. So uh, what about you? Did you kind of, you know, uh, once you became an author, which kind of added up to everything else that you were known for, now you had yet another thing which, which you became. Uh, did you need any kind of, I don't know how to phrase this, rebranding type of thing to adjust to this new role of yours or not? Well, you know, the being an author was actually great because um, – one of the one of the challenges i think for a lot of professionals and i count myself among them is uh, it's kind of the what i'll call the renaissance person phenomenon which is that it seems like half the world is very content to narrow cast and to specialize you know to develop a niche and then just be known for that and the truth is those people have, I think, a little bit of an advantage because it is far easier if you are willing to choose a niche and dive in, uh, it's far easier to get known for that. And this is actually something I talk about in Stand Out that – uh, people, uh, you, you know, if, if I say that I want to be an expert in politics, well, you know what? There's a lot of people who know a lot about politics. Probably there's a lot of people who know more than I do about politics. And so there's not a very compelling reason for the media to turn to me for comment or for, you know, a client to hire me. Mm -hmm. But if I say I'm going to become an expert in Armenian politics, well, all of a sudden there's a lot less competition. And if I start writing and blogging about Armenian politics, politics every single day, before long, I am going to be a pretty dominant force because, you know, the, the major outlets internationally are not covering Armenia every single day. If I do, um, you know, I'm going to be showing up on the first page of Google very fast. And so um, that kind of specialization is, is a helpful ticket to the front of the line. However, the problem is the other half of the world, you know, the half that I'm in, really hates doing that, really hates <laughs> specializing because I'm interested in a lot of things. I get I get bored if I have to uh, just oh, do yeah, one me thing. Too. <laughs> yeah. And so there's lots of stuff I want to try. And so it makes it a little bit harder. And, you know, so so there's good and bad with everything, right? And so I think the good is that at the end, like at the end of the process, you probably have a richer and deeper understanding because by studying and being involved in a lot of different things, you're able to make interesting connections, you learn different things, you have this broad perspective, but it's a slower process to the top than it is for people who just go narrow and do that. And so something that was a blessing for me actually was that in writing these books, I automatically got recognized as having expertise in these issues. You know, in the, in the case of Reinventing You, it was personal branding and professional reinvention. And in the case of Stand Out, it was about thought leadership and about how to develop innovative ideas. Um, those, those topics are great. Those are things I love to think about and speak about. If I had had to sort of proactively choose, I'm not sure I actually could have or would have said, yeah, this is the thing I'm going to be an expert in. But writing the book, 
uh, kind of uh, kind of made that happen mm-hmm. without my having to pull the trigger. <laughs> okay, I see. So, what would you suggest? I mean, many. I, I'm getting this question uh, too, and I myself am one of them. So, you mentioned that there are people who who kind of who are interested in many different things, and it's very different, difficult to choose just one thing and focus on it, and especially kind of niche it down to even like a more narrow field, let's say. So let's say someone who is doing different things like, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, writing and podcasting and, you know, maybe some other interests that are not related to those two. Is there any way, is there any trick to understand how they could be combined somehow? Or it's just, you know, it's several separate things that you have to deal with? Well, you know, if you, if you're talking about someone who's involved in a lot of different channels, that's actually a, an easier process. So in Standout, I actually profile a guy uh, named Mark Fidelman, who I, I thought was doing some really interesting things. I met him because we both were blogging at the time for Forbes. And Mark was writing these posts. Uh, he was writing a lot less often than I was, but but he was writing uh, very, very in-depth posts that would get a lot of views. And so I was really interested in in his strategy and what he was doing. And what I learned was that he, the posts that he was doing, he would take up to 100 hours per post, wow. which sounds crazy, but the, but really he had a great strategy for it, which is that he realized that any post that he did, he wanted to absolutely max out the value of it. So he would do things like, uh, he'd create a roundup post where he would do something like the top 25 CMOs on social media. And so he would, you know, have this process by which he would select the people. Then he would interview, you know, all the people so that he could use it as a networking tool to meet the people that he wanted to meet. Uh, and of course, you know, they're going to be profiled in this nice story. So they all wanted to meet him and talk to him as well. Uh, then he would uh, make sure in addition to the interview, he would get a special tip from them. And then he would create an ebook. There was an opt-in email ebook uh, uh-huh. that was like top, <laughs> top tips from the 25 CMOs. And so he'd be, he'd be able to use it to build his email list. So that was pretty powerful. Then he would hire people on, you know, websites like, uh, like Elance or Odesk and they, you know, for, for, cheap amounts of money and he would have the uh the post turned into an infographic he would have it turned into slide shares he would take quotes from the post and you know tweet it out you know a million different ways and a million different quotes um and so you know really it's taking one thing that you're doing and finding the way to max it out and uh, to just get the get the total value from it. And so I'd say, you know, if you're if you're blogging, if you're podcasting, if you're doing all these things, find ways to combine them. You know, I mean, it would be very easy to interview somebody for a podcast and, you know, so you record it, you you put up the audio. That's great. That's sort of the raw material, but then you can write a blog post based on your conversation and what you learned from the conversation. You can do uh, you know, a 1-minute uh video where you give the, you know, the highlights, like the number, you know, if, if you were doing it for this interview, you could do the, you know, the number one tip I learned from Dory or something like that in a video, you send a bunch of tweets, um, you know, there's uh, maybe, maybe you take a pull quote from this interview where I've been, in theory, incredibly articulate and you make a little placard and then you put it and tweet it out and, you know, put it on Instagram or something like that. So th- there's, a, there's a lot of different ways that you can do one interview for one hour, um, but use it 100 times, as I mm-hmm. talked about in Stand Out. Mm-hmm, I see. Well, since you mentioned Forbes, I'm absolutely sure that everyone would be interested how one could write for those big um, websites? Is it just like the traditional publishers that you have to grow until a certain point to be able to write for them? Or is there something else? Well, you know, I actually talk about this in a blog post that I wrote. And if you're interested, Ani, you could uh, include it in the show notes. But, oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Folks can, uh, can if they Google my name, Dory Clark, and then the post, uh, I, I put it up on LinkedIn. It's called How to Start Writing for High Profile Blogs. And uh, I, I walk people through the, the process that I used. 
But in the case of Forbes, actually, um, I did have a very systematic process and I did not have any connections going in. Um, what I did was I made, I, I decided I wanted to start writing for more publications. So I, um, this is a couple of years ago, um, I guess in two, late 2011. Uh, so I made a list of about maybe two dozen uh, publications that, you know, and, and some of them were magazines, some were newspapers, some were television networks, but all of which had an online presence with articles. And so I made a list of, of good possibilities that I'd like to write for. And then I went through a process of going through and saying, okay, A, do they have a blog? B, do they have outside contributors for their blog? Or is it just, you know, their own staffers? And then if they met both of those criteria, I would hunt around and try to find the the email address online for the person who was the web editor. Mm -hmm. And then I had a uh, a pitch letter that I would send out, which basically included a brief bio of me, links to articles that I had done previously so they could check out my writing samples, and then a little bit about how often I'd want to write and what types of things I would want to write about. And so I put I put all that into you know just a short, maybe two-paragraph email, sent it off to them. Out of about two dozen, I would say I got about three responses. Um, so, you know, not not great, not horrible. Uh, I mean, you know, it's it's funny because, you know, I, I felt like going into it, I had some pretty good credentials. By that point, I was blogging regularly for the Harvard Business Review and the Huffington Post. But, you know, even with that, um, you know, a lot of these people are busy, they're overwhelmed, and sometimes they're just stupid. And so, you know, you get someone who's a good writer and say, hey, I'd like to write for you for free. And they're all like, no, you know, forget that. <laughs> it's like, really guys? All right. Um, but anyway, about three people wrote back to me, two of them, uh, you know, they just kind of dropped off. They just, um, you know, they, they got busy or they weren't interested or whatever. But the one that took actually out of all of this was Forbes. And, uh, so part, part of it really is luck and timing because Forbes was in a pa- in a place right then where they were uh, very actively looking to expand their contributor network. Mm-hmm. And so uh, they, you know, they were in the mode of looking and I came to them and they were like, yeah, okay, great. So within two days, I had a response back on email and within uh, 10 days, I had had a phone conversation with the editor and had gotten signed up and was in the system and was starting to write for them. So, uh, so it, it worked well, but it, it all did come from a, a cold pitch, you know, cold email pitch. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting, because, you know, it's it's always difficult to cult pitch such big publications. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, let's just try to kind of, you know, if, if we try to wrap this up and, you know, come up with several um, most important, like, things that the newbie writers should not forget from the very start when they are just starting writing their book what are the most important elements that you know things that they should take into consideration and not forget yeah absolutely so i think you know one thing that's been really valuable for me that i'll mention is just building a community of writers and, uh, you know, this is helpful in a lot of ways. I mean, it's helpful, uh, to, you know, at whatever stage you're in. I mean, if you're in the very earliest stages, uh, if you have a community of other writers, they can help introduce you to agents. They can give you tips about what publishers are good to work with and what aren't. Uh, they can, you know, probably they're doing similar things to you. So they might be able to connect you with bloggers or, or with, sorry, with blogging opportunities, uh, things like that, just provide moral support. And so, um, so one of the uh, the ways that I've been doing it now, I live in New York currently. And so for about a year, ever since I moved here, um, I have been convening regular, pretty much monthly author dinners where I invite um, authors that I know and then, you know, I'll solicit recommendations from friends about people that I don't know uh, and just bring them together for for a dinner so that we can all get to know each other and build a little bit of that sense of community. And people are generally very excited to go to something like that. I mean, they don't, they generally don't have enough um, fellow authors in their own lives. And having that is is just really useful so that you can learn from other people and avoid common mistakes. Um, when you hear other people's stories, that's helpful. And these are people later on who can do things like blurb your book or, uh, you know, maybe some of them are bloggers or podcasters too. So you might be able to trade, uh, trade favors when it comes to, uh, to the promotional time, but building that community is, uh, is really helpful and essential. 
Oh yeah, and it's it's you know uh, writing a book is a lonely process anyway, so it's always nice to kind of periodically get out of that state and interact with others as well. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for spending this time with us and coming over and sharing your thoughts and experiences and uh, knowledge. It was really nice meeting you and speaking to you, and I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you so much, Ani. I, I really appreciate you having me. And I'll actually just mention quickly for your listeners that in case they're interested in in this process of developing your breakthrough ideas and building a following around it, um, I actually have a free 42-page standout workbook that I developed um, that folks can download for free on my website, which is doryclark.com, D-O-R-I-E-C-L-A-R-K.com. And I hope that might be helpful to them in the process. Oh, great. And I will include your website and the article about how to write for big uh, websites in the show notes as well. So we'll, we'll have everything there. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, that was it for today. For those of you who are curious, I'd like to say that, yes, I actually went to Facebook and did the three-word exercise. And I encourage you to do so too because it actually brought up very surprising results and um, it kind of... um, made me realize a few things which I didn't before. So go ahead, do the exercise, go to Dory's website and get the free ebook with lots of useful information. And if you have time, why not check out my website too at anialexander.com and also For those of you who haven't left a review on iTunes yet, please do so because it really helps the podcast grow. Okay, well, I guess that's all. Have a great week and I'll meet you in the next episode.